event tonight, um, you are here to learn about the top college admission trends for the 2023-2024 school year. And your speaker tonight is Anda Lynn. Uh, she has nearly 30 years of experience working with students and is a former public school teacher and author who founded Educational Connections in 1998, uh, where her team provides tutoring, executive function coaching, test prep, and college admissions counseling in the DC area and beyond. So we're very excited to have her. We do multiple of these a year with her and she's always a fantastic speaker. Uh, so Anne, we're, we're super excited to have you. Um, Thanks Robin. Uh, and before I officially turn it over to her, just want to quickly uh, do a shout out to a UVA resource that not a lot of people know about, um, but it's called College Compass, and it was created for UVA alumni families with students pursuing the college application or transfer process, and it's led by an expert team of college advisors, uh, provides a trusted personal college planning experience with curated resources and a unique place to connect with other families in a similar stage. Uh, have to do the plug. It does not help you get into UVA specifically, uh, but it's to help with the college admissions process as a whole. Um, I will quickly drop the link to that in the chat. And uh, with that, we'll hand it over to Anne. Thanks so much, Robin. I always love talking to the parents of the UVA Club of DC. So it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, so much has changed when it comes to college admissions, you know, certainly since the pandemic, and I would even say in the last year. Um, so why have we seen all these changes? You know, and why are we we always hear like, oh my gosh, school is more competitive than ever before. Um, if I were a student applying today, I would never get into the college I got into years ago. And one of the reasons it's become so competitive is because of the test optional movement. It used to be to apply to a top tier college, not only did you have to have great grades, but you also had to have really good test scores too on the SAT or the ACT. But during COVID, and actually we saw this trend even before the pandemic, schools started to go test optional. And they said, you know what? Look, if you don't want to submit a test score, you don't have to, and we won't hold that against you. And so this test optional movement really opened up um, options to kids that may not have applied to a top tier school because they didn't have the test scores. So it enabled a lot of kids to kind of throw their hat into the ring. So that's one reason the things that things have changed and we're seeing a lot more applicants. We're also seeing a lot of first generation students and colleges often look favorably on these students. And so for that reason, and there has been a big push to get these kids to apply to college, we're also seeing that the numbers of first generation students are way up. And then lastly, you know, before um, COVID, kids went to schools. They actually drove to schools or flew to schools and went on campus tours to get a flavor of the university. But during COVID, um, colleges got really, really good at marketing their schools to kids online. And for that reason, kids don't go on college visits like they did before. They might after they're accepted, but not always when they're in the just the kind of looking around phase. And so um, for that reason, kids are thinking, ah, oh, you know, many of these schools don't take into account demonstrated interest, which we'll talk about later. Um, you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and apply even though I haven't been there. So what does all this mean? It means that there are actually more applications being sent to schools um, for the same amount of slots, which makes it super competitive. The Common App, which is what most schools use when kids are applying to their college, they are reporting that the volume, the number of applications submitted to all the schools that take the Common App is up 65% from the 2019-2020 school year to the 2023-24 school year. And that is absolutely huge. So that has resulted in lower acceptance rates at school and it becoming a numbers game. And it's sometimes confusing to kids because, you know, years ago, it was kind of predictable. Um, you had good grades, you had good test scores, you had some extracurriculars and you were in. But now with grade inflation, so many kids are uber qualified. 
Um, I think UVA reported uh, and on their data set that 90% of students um, that applied had over a 4.0 GPA. And so we're seeing that things have really changed when it comes to the quality of applicants. And for kids, you know, sometimes it can be confusing because they are really qualified. Um, and so really helping them to stand out is a whole different thing. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So let's look at some of the statistics um, in our area. These are schools that kids often apply to. Maryland, for some kids, it was a safety school, but it's no longer like that. They accept 45% of students. And at face value, it seems like, oh, that's kind of a lot. Almost half the kids get in. But also think that kids applying to a flagship state school are really qualified. They Many of them have really good grades. And if they're submitting test scores, really good test scores. So it's still a very competitive school. Look at UVA, they had over 50,000 applications. Um, this is for this year's this year's class. So this is last year's data. And 19% were admitted. JMU, um, 37 applicate, 37,000 applicants uh, for 74% admit rate. And Penn State, um, similarly, used to really be a safety school for a lot of kids in this area, but not so much anymore. They're seeing a huge increase in volume of applicants um, and a 55% acceptance rates rate. So, you know, when kids think of schools, it's it is easy to think, what's in my neighborhood? Um, what are the schools that I hear about? What are the name brand schools? But we at Educational Connections really encourage kids to think outside the box because there are often schools that you may not consider that could be a really great match. And by thinking outside the box, we encourage kids to look at programs or the major that you want to, um, that you intend in st to study at other schools. What are the programs they offer? What is the learning environment like? What is job placement like? You know, it's interesting because sometimes we see JMU as a school that a lot of kids apply to. But what we don't, parents don't always know is they have the one of the highest job placement rates in the state. Um, what are the social and extracurricular opportunities for kids, the cultural opportunities? All of these things are things that we might find in other schools outside of the ones that just kind of the top 20 that are often the, the tip of kids' tongues. For example, if a student wants to study entrepreneurship, you know, it doesn't have to be at um, an Ivy League school, but what about Babson College? It's in Wellesley, Massachusetts, and it is the premier school for entrepreneurship, and it's known around the world. For finance, we often think of the Wharton School at UPenn, but actually the Eli School of Business at Michigan State and Indiana University Kelly School of Businesses Business are both very highly rated. Um, we often think of Juilliard for the performing arts, but did you know that University of Cincinnati and Ithaca um, both have really well-known programs? So when we see, when we think about um, thinking outside the box, it's again, looking at other schools that may not always be so obvious. So how do you do that? Well, when we work with students, our college counselors, um, help students, one of the things that we'll do is help them to craft a list. And that means on the list of schools that they're thinking about, it's important to have most likely schools. These are schools that, you know, it, it's likely that you're going to get in. Target means those schools right in the middle, meaning you're kind of right in the middle of their range. And then reaches, these are schools that are pretty hard to get into. Um, and these are schools that, that will be a reach for you. And so often when kids come to us and, you know, every day we're talking to parents calling our that call our office looking for help for their kids. And I will say that a common thread, not always, but for most kids have these ideas of schools that they want to attend and their lists are very, very reach heavy. And so, again, it's easy to think, well, I have good grades and I have good test scores. I fit into this profile, I can go there. And there's a difference between qualified and competitive. And so our goal is to help kids, number one, think outside the box and find schools that they may not have thought about before, but could be a stellar match for them. 
and then to make sure they have a smattering of schools in their reach, their target, and most likely so that they have a balanced list. Also, when we help kids craft this list, we want to make sure that they're considering things like, does a school that I've loved since second grade have the major I want to major in? Or I'm not sure what I may want to major in. Does this school have an exploratory program for me? What is the cost? How about the location? Do I want to be close to home or far away? Um, do I have to be in state due to tuition requirements? Or can I be out of state? What are the differences in acceptance rates in state versus out of state? Do I want a big school, a medium school, a small school? Are going to Big Ten football games important to me? What is the sports program like at these? And so these are all factors that, that kids consider and that we help them think about when they're creating a balanced list. And then lastly, parents will often ask, you know, how many kids, how many schools should my child apply to? And it really varies um, student to student. Some kids will just apply to maybe three or four because they absolutely know where they want to go and their schools are, you know, kind of towards the lower end of their list. But for most kids, they're going to apply, at least the kids we work with, between seven and 12 schools. And that is a good, 12 is definitely a high end, um, but right in there, that's a good amount of schools to apply to. Um, so sometimes parents will always also ask, how do I craft a list? Well, there's lots of ways you can craft a list. If your child goes to a private school, they have really great um, counselors that can work with your child on their list. Public schools are a little bit harder. Most public schools have a 300 or 350 to one ratio. So it's not a good chance that your child's gonna get one-to-one -one attention and lots of help crafting their list and completing their applications. Um, sometimes you can use the internet. You could use the FISC guide as an example to help you create this list. And then for other students, they get professional help and they have somebody help them um, with the whole application process, which is what we do. So um, we create, talked about the list. Um, also, in, in thinking about this, it's important to know what you need to do at each grade level. And for that reason, I've created this for you. It's a checklist. So this is what you should do in ninth grade. This is what you should do in 10th grade. Here's 11th grade. And then if you've got a senior, these are the last things that they have to do. And you can get that on our website um, by going to ectutoring.com slash college dash consulting, and you can download it. And I think this is just a really nice guide to keep everybody on track. Um, I'll mention this again at the end in case um, you don't have time to write this down or you don't have a pencil nearby. Um, all right. So that's crafting a list. So we talked about what students want in a school. But what about what colleges are looking for? Because that can be different. So what are the most important factors to colleges? Well, turns out it's what you've probably heard in the past. It's grades and it's grades in the classes that count. So the rigorous classes, meaning are you taking A, B, AP, IV or dual enrollment classes? Those classes constitute rigor. And for some schools, they also look at honors classes as rigor, but not every school constitutes honors in the same way. So it's grades and it's the rigor of your schedule. Parents often say, is it better to get um, an A in a regular class or a B in an IB class or an AP class? And the answer is, if you're applying to a, a very competitive school, it's better to take the harder class and to work really hard and get the best grade that you can because rigor really matters to schools. Um, the test scores, we're seeing a big change. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're seeing a big shift in the last year back towards testing. And during COVID, lots of kids didn't take the SAT or the ACT because their tests were canceled. Um, they Sometimes they went to do, take the test and nobody was there. There were lots of reasons. So for that reason, colleges said, you know what, we're just test optional. But many schools are now bringing back um, tests and they are tracking their kids on how they do in college. 
And I was just, for example, at a talk by the um, one of the admissions directors at Boston College. And um, he said, we've, we're compiling data and we're seeing evidence that supports testing. So they are a school, for example, that really likes to have test scores. Um, and so test scores to them, submitting a test score is really important. And two thirds of the kids that they took in this year's class were, they did apply with test scores. So some schools do not care about test scores, but for other schools, they do care a lot like Boston College. And then there are other schools that we would like to see your test score. We're not gonna penalize you if you don't have it, but if it helps you, you should absolutely submit it. Um, essays. Essays are the one thing that makes you unique. We'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but a lot of kids have can have good grades. A lot of kids have can have good test scores. A lot of kids can get really good letters of recommendation, but your essay is your only chance to just be unique to you. Nobody else can write the essay like you can write the essay. So there's an essay on the Common App, and there are also supplemental um, essays. There's an uh, there are supplemental essays on colleges apps and also on the Common App. And could, kids should do everything. Um, it's really not optional. Even if a school says it's optional, in, in, insist that your child does it. Essays are important, letters of recommendation, especially if they tell a story or the teacher says something like, this, this student is the best student I've seen in biology in the last five years. That carries a lot of weight. Um, and then so does the activities section on the common application. There are actually 10 spaces for students to write the things that they participated in while they've been in college, starting in ninth grade. And you do not have to fill everything out. In fact, you know, if you have some really good activities or extracurriculars that you really went deep in, you're probably not going to fill everything out because that would make it look like, you know, you've done a lot of things in a shallow way. But for many kids that are trying to um, position themselves as maybe a business school student, they may have fewer things, but what they have is really valuable to craft their narrative. And that's what we're gonna talk about next is how to craft your unique narrative. So what is a narrative? A narrative is kind of like your story. It's what makes you unique. When a college admissions um, representative reads your application, what do they come away with? Is it just a bunch of random things on your activities list, your course selection? Um, there's nothing too special in your essay. Or are you the student with a unique voice about something you feel passionate about? Or as I mentioned, are you the kid um, that wants to go to business school and that maybe started their own side hustle? Uh, you took a business class over the summer at your community college and you've taken high level math classes in your high school. Those are things that help craft a narrative. But the truth is kids that are applying undecided um, these days has grown exponentially. In fact, about 50% of students applying to four-year schools nationwide do not know what they want to do. And this is really normal. I think it's, in my experience, really hard for a 17-year-old to know what exactly they want to be when they grow up. They're not sure, and that is okay. Um, they can apply depending on where they're applying to. They do not always have to make a decision. One of the things that we do with our students that we work with is we want to know what their natural abilities and inclinations are. And we have an assessment called Achieve Works. And Achieve Works is awesome because it looks at kids' personality, their skills, and their learning and productivity. And I like it because a lot of times kids come to us and they'll say, you know, I'm just kind of average. There's nothing really unique about me. Um, and we'll do achieve works with them and we'll say, actually, you have this really interesting skill set here and that aligns with this major in this career. Have you ever thought about it? And all of a sudden, okay. kids that kind of think like I'm just one of many start to see themselves differently. And that's what really we want because that's what helps position kids well on their application. All right, so um, that's a little bit about crafting a narrative. 
But let's get down to the things that kind of are the first round. Because if you don't have good grades and um, good rigorous classes, you're not going to get into the second door. So what does that look like? First, there's a strategy around course selection. And it is this time of year that kids are selecting their courses for the fall. This is a really important time. So what I would recommend, if you haven't done this, um, and if you have a child who's in ninth, 10th, even eighth grade, um, 11th, definitely 11th too, have a conversation around course selection. That's what we're doing with our students right now. And we want to see what they're taking um, so that that aligns with their narrative. So for example, if this is a student who wants to go into engineering, that student really needs to be taking the most rigorous courses possible in math and science. We want to make sure. If this is a student who maybe wants to go into marketing, um, could they take a class that's related to that in school as an extra, as an elective? Um, maybe it's a student that wants to go into um, sports psychology. Have they taken a class that aligns with that? So we want to make sure that the rigor is there and that things that kids are interested in are there too. Um, so this is a discussion that you want to have it now. And it's, it's one of those things that if kids get course selection right, it's early on, it sets them up for um, success later. Sometimes we see kids when they're juniors and they're not on the right math path because they didn't take the right math class early on. And so it kind of set them behind. So it's just something to think about. And the other thing I'll mention is that senior year course selection is really, really important. And sometimes kids will say, um, oh, you know, the senior year doesn't matter. Um, nobody, nobody's gonna see my grades. First, it depends, because if you get deferred, um, if you're on the wait list, your, your grades are going to count and they're going to count a lot. But schools will see your course selection. And that's really, really important. And schools like UVA want to see that you've taken classes, you've signed up for classes that are rigorous and they're aligned with what you want to do. Um, the other thing that you have control now is to really think ahead about the summer for your student and make sure that it's a summer of intention. Um, sometimes kids are happy enough to take a break and just to sit around, you know, playing Xbox or watching TV. But if you really want to apply to a competitive schools, this is actually a really good time to explore your interests, to try to figure out what do you love doing? Maybe you love animals. You're not sure if you actually want to go into this, but um, maybe over the summer you um, volunteer at your local animal shelter. Maybe you have a job shadow where you shadow the executive director of the animal shelter. You could take a class in zoology. Um, so it's a time that you can build your narrative. Again, it could be an online course. There are a gazillion online courses that kids take. I did a webinar yesterday with one of our college counselors, Kristen, um, and she's fabulous. And she was talking about a student that she works with, um, and he was gonna he was going to go into civil engineering. But when she looked at his transcript, she noticed that he had three classes in automotive automotive tech. And she said, well, that's interesting. So you're interested in cars. And he's like, yeah, I love cars. I love everything about cars. And she said, did you know there's a major um, in automotive engineering? And he had no idea. So um, not only did his transcript reflect that, but he spent time over the summer. Um, he job shadowed somebody. He also took another class. And he found schools that um, have that major. And that really shifted the trajectory of, um, of the rest of high school. Um, my son, my youngest son, he's um, now he's a senior at JMU. And um, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but he, but he had this little side gig of creating videos for kids that had bands. And he would go to their local concerts and he would film them um, performing and he would make videos. And so he decided that he might consider video production as a major. So that was really his um, 
really what he spent time on. Um, that was his narrative. So he went to the Fairfax County courthouse and he got um, a $75 business license. So he had a little business uh, license. He also took a class at George Mason on video production over the summer. It was for high schoolers. And, you know, he spent time over the summer just building on his interests. He ended up um, looking for schools with that major and applied in that direction. But now he's a political science major. But it did help him um, to, dis, you know, to, to see what he wanted to do, what he didn't want to do. And you can always change later. In fact, 50% of students that go into college with, with a major end up changing their major. Um, so anyways, the summer is just a great time to really explore. Other factors that schools consider are demonstrated interest. Um, so demonstrated interest means, are you showing that you want to go to that school? So for example, um, Christopher Newport loves demonstrated interest and they wanna see that you came to a tour on their campus, that you opened their emails. Um, they actually have in-person interviews. So does William and Mary. And um, if you go to those interviews and you do a good job, that's showing demonstrated interest. So for many of schools, they want to know that if they say, I'm going to accept you, that you're going to come because that's your their yield rate. And the yield rate is really important to schools. But other schools like University of Virginia, they naturally have a high yield rate. Um, so for them, demonstrated interest isn't considered so much. You'll definitely find that in large public flagship universities um, like Penn State, for example. So those large schools, Maryland, they don't consider demonstrated interest because it's just too much to track. Um, but other schools, they really, really consider it. I was at a college panel last week, and um, the, as I mentioned, the, the rep from Boston College was there, University of Florida, University of Colorado, and University of Tampa. And BC, Florida, and Colorado do not consider demonstrated interest. But University of Tampa is a much smaller private liberal arts school, and to them, it's really important. And they want to see that you've come to their school, that you showed an interest. Um, so that's what demonstrated interest is. Um, somebody asked a question to the rep for Boston College, like, do you consider demonstrated interest? And he said, well, actually, yes, because they have early decision. And he framed it in a way that I thought was clever because he said early decision is really the hallmark of all demonstrated interest. It shows that if you get in, you will absolutely go there. And um, so for schools with demo, schools with early early decision, that is the best form of demonstrated interest. Other thing that things that matter are having a testing plan. And that means that even if schools are test optional, you should your child still should sit and take either the SAT or the ACT. They do not need to take both. Um, schools across the country, except both tests. No school has a preference, so it doesn't matter. So we recommend that kids do take a test because if they, for example, decide, I'm going to take the SAT, I've taken the PSAT over multiple years, I like the new digital format, we'll talk about that in a second, um, and that test just kind of feels familiar to me, I'm going to take the test. Great. You should absolutely take a test because even if your score isn't fabulous and you may not submit it to your reach schools, but it could help you with some of your safety or your target schools. So we encourage all kids, um, unless they have major reasons why they don't want to take a test, to just try it out and have a score in your back pocket. So here are some pros and cons of testing. A pro is that it gives the school another data point. And at an, in an era where there is so much grade inflation, um, a test score, that's a solid test score within the school's range can really help students. Um, and remember, requirements are changing. There are many schools that it's not optional. For example, University of Georgia, which is a very popular school near uh, um, it, on the East Coast, Florida, all the Florida state schools, Florida State, they all require tests. 
The cons, if you don't submit a test, it's one less data point. So there will be a greater scrutiny on your essay, your grades, your extracurriculars. So what is the SAT and ACT? I'll just kind of quickly mention this. Um, and by the way, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. We're going to go to questions at the end. So the SAT is considered a power test. That means that um, there, aren't, there, there aren't a ton of questions on this test, but they are very wordy, meaning you have to kind of read between the lines and figure out what is this question really asking me? Even in math, some of the questions are a little bit tricky. So they require a lot of analysis. Um, and the difficulty in the SAT is really in the interpretation. Uh, it's not so much getting through the test. Also, the SAT has two parts. It has an 800 point math and an 800 point evidence-based reading and writing. So math is half of the test on the SAT. But on the ACT, it's a little bit different. The ACT has four sections. Um, only one of them is math. One of them is writing, one of them is reading, and one of them is science. The science one is actually a lot of, it doesn't have chemistry or biology or anything like that. It's a lot of charts and tables where you have to extract um, meaning. And so it's a lot of really problem solving. And I think the ACT is definitely a more coachable test, especially the science section. So the ACT is considered a speed test. You have to go at a faster clip in order to get through it. There are more questions than on the SAT, um, but they're shorter and they're definitely more straightforward. So kids will often say, I like this test um, because I understand what they're asking me. Um, on the other hand, kids will say with the SAT, I like this test because um, I felt like I could get through everything. So again, the difficulty on the ACT is in the speed, it's in the pacing. If your child happens to have accommodations like a 504 or an, um, a, a 504 or an IEP, many kids end up going with the ACT because the difficulty of speed is eliminated when you get time and a half. So you probably heard about the digital SAT rollout. Well, we saw the PSAT come out in 2023, October, um, and it turned out to be okay. There were a couple of glitches, but it was pretty good. And we're expecting the March 2024 test to hopefully be okay too. Every time the SAT changes their format, there's some type of glitch. Um, so for that reason, we're seeing juniors that say, you know what, I don't want something new. Um, I'm going with tried and true. The ACT has been around. I know the format, pencil and paper. I like that. I can mark up my book. I'm good. I'm just going to go with the ACT. Some of our students that we work for test prep are saying, you know what, I want to take the test. I don't want to mess with digital. Um, I just, I know what I'm getting into with it, the current version of the pencil and paper, the ACT, SAT, I'm just going to do that. So they're taking um, the test up until this month, and then they're, they may not take it again. Um, most kids will take the test the fall of their junior year, but they should absolutely take it again the spring of their junior year, because statistically speaking, that's when your scores are the best. You have, you know, you're just more mature. You've got more time under your belt, more curriculum. Um, sometimes you have more time to prep. So just because you're older and you've been in school longer, that also indicates better scores. Um, so when we're working with kids, we help to craft the plan. First of all, which test is going to be best for you and when are you going to take it? Um, so these are the upcoming dates and you can find all of these online too. And you can see the first, the, the next date of the SAT is that, that digital SAT um, in March. All right. So what is that going to look like? Well, there are certain things that are staying the same. Still a 1600 point scale. Um, some of the kids are asking, Do, can I take it at home? And the answer is no. Um, you take it at school just like you would before. Um, same accommodations, same subject matter. Um, but what's changing is that it's shorter. It's two hours instead of three, which is amazing. Um, although you can annotate a little bit on the screen, it's not the same as annotating in the test booklet. So some kids say that, you know, 
they don't love that part, they'd rather have a test booklet that they can mark up as much as they want. Um, another thing I like about it is it's offered more frequently. You get your score in a few days instead of weeks, which is now the case, two weeks. Um, but the biggest change is that it's adaptive, meaning when you start the test, you're going to get a set of questions. And depending on how you do on that first set will dictate what your next set of questions is going to look like. And so if you don't do well on the first section, the next questions you get aren't going to be those really hard ones. They're going to be a little bit easier, more for your level. So that means that you cannot get the top, top score. Um, and so, you know, I believe that if kids are going to take a test, they should prepare for it. They should, even if they prepare on their own with a tutor, whatever, but there should be some preparation involved. So they show up, they know what to expect, um, and they can have a good handle on what they're going to see. So that is testing. All right, let's boil it down to what kids should be doing in different grades. And I want to start out with current juniors. So current juniors, um, right now, their focus should be on course selection and making sure that they have the most rigorous classes within their wheelhouse. So for example, if they're a math and science kid, they need to be taking um, rigorous math science classes, AP, IB, or dual enrollment. Um, maybe if they can also handle uh, very rigorous English or humanities classes, they should do that too. But kids tend to know themselves. And sometimes kids will say, all I can handle is math and science and I'm good. This is going to be way too challenging. And there has to be a balance where you can do other things in your life. You can play a sport. You can have time with your friends. And it's no fun for anybody if you're way too overcommitted. So having a good balance of course selection um, is really important. Focusing on grades, obviously, that's that's so incredibly important that kids have enough time um, to put in for grades. That they also have a solid testing plan. They know if they're going to go forward with the SAT or the ACT. And by the way, if you're kind of stuck on that, I'm happy to help you. Um, I have a couple of counselors I work with that talk to parents all the time and are happy to chat with you about that about a testing plan. So that's important to know your junior year and knowing what you're gonna do over the summer too. Um, it is not too early. Many of the programs that kids do apply for, they um, are applying, some of them, they started applying in the fall, this past fall. So they can be competitive and it's important to look into these things early. So again, use the summer to hone your narrative. And then you want to be able to craft and refine your college list. And once you have a solid college list, um, it's a great time to, you know, over spring break or if there's a teacher work day that you're able to go to some of these schools, take a tour and get a flavor of the campus. Um, oh, and then also interviews. I think I touched on interviews uh, just a few minutes ago. Some schools do have interviews, not a lot, but if you're if the school your child's interested in has an interview, they should 100% absolutely go. Um, I was just looking at Christopher Newport's page earlier today, and it used to be that their interviews were only in person, and they they take them seriously. Um, but now they also have virtual in interviews. So if that if the school does have that opportunity, your child should sign up early to get the best time and and be able to go to those interviews. Um, so what should you be doing in ninth grade? Obviously, focusing on, focusing on grades, course selection, and really thinking about extracurriculars and how you want to use your summer. Um, it's okay. Kids don't need to be doing ten different things. If they like soccer and their passion is playing a sport, that's amazing. Maybe on the side, they can teach young kids how to play soccer. They could run a little clinic in your backyard. Um, maybe they should start a drive of old soccer shoes to give to disadvantaged students. Those are all things that, that can be impactful. And maybe your child does that summer after summer. Um, those are things that really look great in a college application. And then just a, you know, um, an idea to think about 
anytime we can plan ahead and start early, it doesn't actually put more stress on our kids. It does put stress on our kids if we're talking about, you know, where are you going to go and what are you going to do? But just thinking about, okay, let me plan ahead so that I'm in control of this and it doesn't control me actually reduces stress. Oftentimes we see kids come to us the spring of their junior year and it's really late for them if they haven't crafted a college resume. Uh, we still will make it work for them and they will absolutely turn in the best pro product possible. But it's hard when kids are at the 11th hour. We often get seniors um, in the fall of their senior year and they haven't done anything yet. And it's incredibly stressful. So starting a little bit early and planning ahead is vital for kids. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but just so you have it, this is the checklist that tells you what you can be doing in ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I would say the ninth grade checklist, it can be used by younger kids too. So if you have a younger child, this can also be helpful. At the end of the day, I will say that there is absolutely college for everybody. And it may not be the brand name school that you're thinking of right now. It doesn't honestly matter um, so much where you go to college, but what you do while you're there. And the advantages that you take of that college really mold you as a person. There are over 2,000 four-year universities throughout the United States. And I do believe um, there are many colleges for kids, but finding that one that's the right fit is key. So on that note, I would love to go to Q&A. Oh, and by the way, um, I'll put my contact information here. We have programs for students starting in eighth grade. Um, we have our, our juniors that we're working with now and our senior express programs. And you can get more information on our website, which is ectutoring.com slash college-counseling, or you can scan this QR code and it will go to our calendar and you can set up a time to talk. All right, so let's go to the Q&A and see... Um, what you guys are thinking about. Hold on, let me see it. Or sorry, not the Q&A, the chat. All right. Um, what is the typical timeline for making lists of schools? Jason, you can start out early on. Um, you know, maybe even I started with my kids when they were probably about 10th grade. And I remember that if we, they, they played golf in high school. And so and for that reason, they had meets all over the DMV. And so if we ever went to a meet, um, like if there was one downtown, sometimes we'd drive through American or we'd look at GW. And so it was very informal, but it gave them a flavor of city schools. Um, sometimes if we went on a road trip as a family, we drive through a university and that gave them a flavor of a more rural school. And so really just talking to kids about, you know, oh, have you thought about this? Um, have you talked to your friends about this? What are you thinking? Is just a good way to start with just like querying questions to them. And you can start that early on, you know, ninth or 10th grade. Let's see, do institutions track attendance at summer camp as demonstrated interest? And that, Rebecca, one of our college counselors, Kristen was talking about that the other day. And, um, you know, she was mentioning that it depends on the summer program. So if it's just like, you know, a golf camp at William and Mary, no, but if it's an environmental studies program, maybe yes, that could help you. It doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to track it, but that could be on your activities list. Um, it's also an opportunity. So let's say your child's interested in environmental studies they can make perhaps a connection with a professor while they're there. Maybe that professor's on campus and they can ask to meet with that person. Those are things that can be really meaningful. Um, how do you build your narrative if you're a very well-rounded student that may not exactly know what your niche is? You know, Lottie, that's really common. And as I mentioned, 50% of kids say that they're not sure what they want to do. Um, one of our college counselors was working with a student a couple of weeks ago, and um, this kid said, you know, I don't know what I want to do. Like, there's nothing really unique about me. And so she's talking to him and 
she looks over his shoulder and she says, what's that behind you? And he's like, oh, this? Um, yeah, it's just like this or origami, um, origami sculpture I made. So basically he loves folding paper and he made, um, he made this sculpture of a bird and not a sculpture. I'm not even sure what you call it, but it was just really fabulous and detailed and took a lot of time and it was really unique to him. And the more they talked about it, he started talking about his love for origami, how he got into it. Turns out fast forward, um, uh, he decided to write his essay on that and what he's learned through the art of origami. And so it doesn't have to be like, I want to be a business major and this is why you should accept me to your school in your essay. It can be something that's unique and special to you. I was, um, I, I went to Boston college and I was reading through our, our little magazine the other day, or actually this wasn't the other day, it was probably last year. And there was a um, Q&A with the admissions director and he was talking about, somebody said, you know, how do you, how do you help your child to stand out? And like BC is super competitive now. And he said, um, actually, I, I got this, I was reviewing this application from the student and her essay was about independence. And she said she came from a family where her parents um, really trusted her to do the right thing. And the essay started out where her first line was, everybody laughed. And then she went on to talk about how in fourth grade, she, um, that her class had a science fair. She did her project by herself. Nobody helped her where all the other kids, their parents helped them with the project. And it really looked like that. So hers looked like, you know, like a nine-year-old did it. And so on display day, everybody laughed at her project. And she told the story of what it was like growing up in a household where her parents had complete faith in her and that she was a very independent person. She started babysitting when she was 11 and that was her side job and it went on and on. And he said, that really stood out to me. That was so unique about her. Um, so schools, it, it doesn't have to be, this is why I'm so great. It can be something unique to you. Also, colleges look very favorably on students that have jobs. So even if you're working at Pizza Hut or Chick-fil-A or you're working at Giant, it doesn't matter. All those jobs show that you are actually a self-motivated, independent person who has probably learned to get along with others. And we've had lots of kids write essays about things that they've learned while holding a job. Um, Ruth or Beth says, what are your thoughts on attending a couple of years of community college before going to a traditional four-year school? And Beth, I think that's a fabulous idea. And sometimes we don't think about that. You know, we think of, oh, I, I, I can only like UVA or bust, but actually Virginia has great programs where kids going to like Nova with a certain GPA um, can transfer into multiple very prestigious universities like UVA. A friend of mine did that um, a number of years ago. And nobody sees on your resume that you went to Nova um, for two years. They just see that you graduated from UVA or whatever school it is. So I think that's a fabulous way in. And it's a great way, you know, for kids that aren't quite sure right now, they need to save a little bit of money. Um, I love that idea. Do you recommend applying to early decision to each top reach school or a school that is still one of your favorites, but more likely to accept you? So early decision, um, you can only apply to one school early decision. And the reason is the way the contract is structured, if you um, are accepted by that school, you have to go. The only time you may re rescind is if you've applied to a school and the financial aid package they give you cannot possibly work. Um, sometimes that's an acceptable reason. So early decision is, um, as I mentioned earlier, the um, best form of demonstrated interest because it's telling the school, if you accept me, I'll go. Um, there have been some changes in universe and demonstrated or, um, early decision. For example, Virginia Tech, just said, we're not going to do that anymore because it kind of puts a wrench in people's plans that have to, that need to know about their financial aid package um, when they apply. 
So that's early decision, but there's also early action. And early action is um, when you're just applying early. So you're usually, depending on the school, you're going to apply um, by November 1st. Sometimes it's by the 15th, but right around there. And by applying early, um, you're going to hear early. So kids already know that are applying that applied early action, whether they got into schools, they, they hear in January, but you don't have to apply early action. You can apply regular decision. And that means your application is usually due in January and you hear back in March. Um, so schools use these as vehicles for accepting students. For example, some schools have early decision, but they don't accept a lot of kids with early decisions. Some take half their class with early decision. Um, some schools will use early action and they'll just cherry pick the very best kids from early action and they'll defer everybody else. And by that, it means they put all the kids they didn't pick into the regular decision pile. So now they're all grouped with regular decision kids and then they pick from there. So those are the three kinds of the three ways um, that kids can apply. All right, so let's see. Um, is a typical teen job like an ice cream shop, camp counselor, local restaurant looked favorably? And the answer is Ryland, yes, absolutely, for sure. Um, what's better for a competitive school application, AP or dual enrollment? I'm not sure because some schools do not have AP or IB. They only have dual enrollment. Um, some schools only have AP. So I'm not exactly sure at your particular school, Logan. Um, I, I'd have to ask one of our college counselors. So if you want to email me, I can absolutely get you that answer. And my email is Ann, A-N-N, at ectutoring.com. And I promise I'll reply back to you. All right. Since test optional is more prevalent, is the AC is an ACT score less competitive than the same score five years ago? And the answer is no. Um, the ACT hasn't changed much, and it's still seen as you know an equally strong test compared to the SAT. Uh, for the adapted SAT hard test. I heard test students will drop down to easier questions if they miss. Is it set up for them to go up for students that say get a certain number of questions in a row correct? If they drop down, is there a way to go up? And the answer is, from what I understand, this has not come out yet, but um, a friend of mine wrote the um, text for um, Barron's for the new digital SAT. And he told me that no, if you if you're down, you don't go up. So, um, but it's not just like if you miss one or two questions. There's a collection of questions, so it really is indicative of what you can do. Um, is a super score is a super score or a flat out score on the ACT preferable? Well, colleges generally use the same software, and this software basically um, cherry picks your best score. So for example, let's say you took the ACT three times, it will cherry pick your best math, your best um, reading, your best writing, your best science, and it will put it into a new collection. And that's called your super score. It does the same with the SAT. And so um, that's why it's in a student's best interest to take this test at least a couple of times because they're only going to look at their top scores. Schools don't see all of their scores. So the software does it. And when the admissions counselor looks at the score, they just see those cherry pick scores. Um, as more kids do not submit test scores, the average score has gone up. Um, I heard you say more schools are bringing back tests, but for those that are that continue to be test optional, do you agree not to submit a score if it is not in the top range? Um, no, I think that if you have a solid score and it's in that range, you should submit it. It used to be, you know, we'd say, because right now the scores are super inflated. And if you look at a school's website, you're like, holy cow, like how are these all these kids scoring like this? And it's because, you know, only the top scores are submitting scores. But I do think it's going to go down 
Uh, we're already seeing this year because a lot of schools are coming back and saying we're test preferred, like which means we really do want to see a test. And so for that reason, more kids are submitting scores. So I think we're going to see them coming down. But even if you see a range like on the ACT, 32 to 35, um, you should absolutely, your child should absolutely submit the score if it's a 32. It also depends on the major. If you're applying to a school with a direct admit major like engineering, you can expect to see high scores in, you know, in the math sessions for sure. Um, you're going to see higher scores overall in math in schools with engineering and, and um, business schools. So, uh, but anyways, I we used to say, well, you had to be in the higher end of the range, but not now. Now, if you're in the range, I would go ahead. And the schools that are test preferred, if you're, you know, if the school is 32 to 35 and you know, a score could help you and you have a 31, don't be afraid to submit it. I'm, that's kind of a blanket statement. And it is honestly different for every child. Um, it is so strategic these days. It's not like it was even five years ago. So, you know, working with somebody who can help you with these decisions, it can be the best way to go. I'm just kind of giving a blanket statement. Um, do I understand correctly that if you need financial aid, you cannot apply early decision? No, that is not true. Um, you you absolutely can apply early decision. It's just that you may not know your financial aid package um, until after you've been accepted, but not early action. You tend to know what your financial aid package is. It, it also depends on the school. Uh, let's see, does taking... Um, DE classes as a junior, and I'm not sure what DE is. Um, increase your chance of being accepted to colleges such as UVA. And does UVA and like schools accept college credits from classes like NOVA that you can earn in high school? Um, I'm not sure about UVA's exact preferences about college credits it is variable. And so my experience has been that sometimes, sometimes they will accept credits and sometimes they won't. Um, you know, same with AP. Um, it depends. Sometimes they'll take that credit if you have a four or five. Um, some schools, they might take it as a credit with three. It really just depends on the school. But, you know, we didn't talk about that. But a lot of times, you know, if you're applying as an engineer major, engineering major, and you have a great AP score, that can help you too, and you should submit it, but you wouldn't submit like a three. That may not be helpful. Uh, do colleges look at the rigor of high school? For example, our two graduated from a public school and our junior is at a very difficult private school where she is taking a, but in the AP classes, they are much more difficult. And the answer is yes, they absolutely look at the school profile. So um, for example, if you go to James Madison High School in Vienna, Virginia, the person at um, Virginia Tech reads all of Madison High School. So that person knows what the school profile is. They know what the top 10% is. They know what the average GPA is. They know all those things about that school. So you are compared to kids in your school. Not, it wouldn't be fair to compare a kid at, um, you know, in Vienna, Virginia to a kid in Appalachia because their experiences are completely different. Furthermore, the weighting system is different at every school. Like in Fairfax County, you get a point um, for um, an AP class, but in Montgomery County, I believe it's a point and a half on your GPA. And so there, it's it's different in every school district. And for that reason, schools look at your profile. Um, for your particular school. How is UVA looking at legacy? Um, and leg UVA came out, I believe, last year and said, um, there's not a checkbox to say I'm legacy or not anymore. But in one of the supplemental applications, I, I believe there's a question um, about your connection to UVA and you can explain it there for sure. Um, some schools take legacy into preference quite a bit and other schools do not. So, um, oh, and does it differ in DC versus in state? Um, 
I, I, I think you mean, does the acceptance rate differ? I'm not sure about D.C., um, but certainly many states have a state charter that says you have to take X amount of students from in-state. So in general, like at University of Michigan, for example, it's much harder to get in out of state because the majority of their students are in-state students, but they get a ton of out-of-state applications. So for many schools, um, it is more competitive out of state. Are there schools that prefer IB? Oh, I forget, we're going over. Um, this will be my last question, I'm sorry. IB versus AP, or is it similar? And schools take whatever you have. Most schools are IB or they're AP, they're not both. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever you want to, do, whatever you have available to you. Um, and DE is dual enrollment, thank you for that. <laughs> I should have done that. All right, so we are out of questions and I just realized we went over time. I hope this has been helpful to everybody. It was a pleasure to speak with you tonight. And Robin, I would love to turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you everyone for your participation and your great questions. Um, we did record this hour and we'll be emailing it out to all event registrants in the next few weeks. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and I will also include Anne's email uh, when we email out the recording, um, I also put it in the chat a little bit earlier in case you have any questions you'd like to email her directly. Uh, and then I guess that's it. Have a good night. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.